But Erica actually is great fun in the field, and I'm sure that you will find her great fun as well now while she talks about the inside out of flies. Her new book, which I'm sure she'll tell you, has just been published. And actually, if she could make a botanist interested in flies, she can make anybody interested in flies. So I'm gonna hand over to you, Erica, and thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Uh, thank you, Sandy. Um, hello, everyone. Um, this is gonna be a very whistle-stop tour of uh, flies. Um, I'm coming to you from the Lake District, and it's actually sunny, which is quite amazing. But when I'm not in the Lake District, I am, found here in the Natural History Museum in the bowels. And I've been working on flies in the collection for about 15 years now. It's hard to tell with time in the museum. And I'm fascinated by their morphology. I'm fascinated about their ecology. I'm just generally fascinated by everything about them. And I, as unusual as some people may think, I'm not alone in my fascination for flies. Um, we have been studying them for um, hundreds of years. So this is uh, an early diagram. This is from 1665 from Robert Hooke's Micrographia, which is a thoroughly amazing book. And he, he jumped on the bandwagon in that period of getting one of these new fangled microscopes. And obviously, what was the man to do with his microscope? He was to look at the best organisms out, and that was the flies. So what we have here is some fantastic images of the head of a horse fly. This is a male. And you can tell it's a male because the eyes, the two compound eyes actually hit each other at the top. Because as I will explain all the way through this, flies are arguably the most flirty of the animals out there. You name it, they seem to have adapted their morphology, all these crazy strange structures to enable the male to go and find the female, defend the female, defend his territory for the female, etc. But she on the other hand, seems to be slightly more interested in her stomach than she does the male, which in many ways is a little like us. So we have been able to start looking at them for hundreds of years, but now we have amazing photography to properly get inside, to properly look at these structures. So this is arguably the closest that most people have been to the head of a housefly intentionally without it annoying them. And you can start to see all these big, amazing uh, morphological features that enable us to tell species apart, that enable these creatures to get in all sorts of different habitats that we wouldn't be able to ourselves get to. So what is a fly? So a lot of people think they know what a fly is. Um, it's an insect. So as an insect, it's got three pairs of legs and three body segments. Uh, amusingly, this photo is a crane fly. And we, we call these flies deciduous because their legs have a tendency to fall off at the slightest provocation. So I've seen these flying around with only two legs, which is not good for the fly, but at least it's still alive. So it is an actual design of the fly, as it were. So it is sitting on a tussock of grass, and as it's bobbing around and the bird comes along and goes, look, tasty fly, tasty fly, and comes down and grabs the fly. The fly is mostly legs, and so can shed these and leave it, and it enables it to fly, fly another day, maybe not walk though. So they've all got technically three pairs of legs, but what makes a fly a fly and the adults is they have suctorial mouth parts. You have never been bitten by a fly. You may have been sliced and maimed and pierced and stabbed, but actually bitten, we leave that to the beetles and the other creatures like that. They have one pair of wings as adults, and instead of a second pair of wings, such as the bees, they have those tiny club-like organs. You can see coming out the thorax, the centre part of the fly, and there it's balancing organs. And these enable flies to become some of the most supreme flyers on the planet. But with flies, it's not all just about the adults. What you're seeing here is a cute little face. Actually, it's not a cute little face. You're looking at the backside of a maggot. It's rather amusing. And what makes flies so amazing is they have a completely different form in their larval stage. And this form enables them to eat different things, live in different places, etc. And not only do they do that, they breathe differently. So they breathe out of their bottoms. And this really does make sense. You spend your mouth part eating and your bottom part breathing. It's fabulous. And it enables them to do all sorts of other things. So this is one that you may find in your garden. This dangling creature here, this is uh, affectionately called a rat-tailed maggot. Okay, and it lives 
in your compost. It lives in your decomposing matter. It loves nothing more than a dank and nasty environment. And we have to be actually really grateful for this because it gets rid of so much of the organic material that would otherwise cause a lot of problems. So the maggot stage is the feeding stage. It's the one that's preoccupied with gaining enough energy, enough nutrients to enable the adult stage to do just very few things. And in a lot of cases, the adult stage doesn't feed at all. But in this stage, this little raptile maggot turns itself into a hoverfly. And this fly, these hoverflies, are some of the top pollinators on the planet. Flies are always ignored when it comes to pollination, which is such a shame because they get into and around in environments that a lot of other creatures can't get to. And they love it. This is a, um, they're not the cleanest at times. It definitely has to be said. This is covered in pollen, just to show you how effective some of these creatures can be. Flies look weird. Okay, they, they seem to have taken your basic body plan and gone, do you know what? I know that's what I'm meant to look like, but I'm gonna look like something completely different. Why on earth this has a red head, we still don't know. And that's the problem with them. We don't know so much about these creatures. Look at the eyes for a start. So uh, the head, the head is the sensory part of the fly. It's where all, where they smell, they see, they visualize, they taste, they do all these different things. And they have so many of these different omatidia, these individual facets. Now a dragonfly has arguably the most of the insects. They have up to 36,000. But flies are unique in the way that they see, because these pictures on the left, those are, if we actually were to slice through those individual facets, these are the light sensory cells. These are the, where the images are, are garnered. And in all other insects, there's only one central uh, sensory state, uh, cell, but in the flies, they've split it up. And so they have much greater sensitivity, much greater acuity. So when you, horrible people are trying to smash the flies with um, your newspapers and things like that. They have a much greater ability to get out of the way. They don't just use their flies for looking. Oh, no, no, no. They use them for flirting and territory guard and everything here. Stork eyes are an amazing group of flies. In fact, it's not just one group. There's, it happened independently 22 times in flies. The females obviously love a stork eye. And it's amazing because they're an optical nerve developed during the pupil stage, the, the, the stage where they metamorphosize themselves from this amorphous maggot into this amazing adult. And then as they emerge from the pupil case, they engulf air and they bing, blow their eye stalks out, which is fascinating to watch. And they use these to show off to the ladies and to defend their territories. So the men will dance and headbutt each other in exactly the same way as deer to defend their territories. Then you've got the mouth parts. Everyone knows about the mouth parts of flies. There's a mosquito who has pierced into you, but not all of them have mouth parts. This adorable little fluffy creature here, which very much resembles a bee, is in fact a bot fly. And as adults, they basically don't feed at all. They don't need to because their larvae have been living up the noses of camels and reindeer or under the skin of humans and consuming huge amounts of energy to enable them to produce this fluffy hirsute adult it's able to go off. We do have mouth parts, as we know, in mosquitoes. And um, as I don't know whether you've done, but I've spent time watching them feeding on me because that's the way I am. And what happens is you've got this amazing uh, proboscis and a stylet, which has got many different functional parts within it. And what is fantastic about mosquitoes, I know most of you again, no, Erica. What is fantastic about them is that that stylet, those mouth parts underneath the skin can move around. So without the mosquito being able to see, it can sense through its different receptors at the end of these mouth parts as it probes down. Now this might sound quite gruesome to us in many ways, but actually it's helping us in the development of smart needles. So when you look at the ovipositor, the egg laying tube of wasps, and the mouth parts of mosquitoes, people much cleverer than myself have gone, do you know what, let's develop needles to enable us to perform surgery round very sensitive material without damaging it. So next time that mosquito is biting you, just say thank you because it may save your life later. 
It's one of my favorite mouth parts, just to show you some of the extremeness that lengths that they can go to. So this is the mouth part of a uh, pollinating fly found in South Africa, and as Sandy would tell you, South Africa, the Cape region, is floristically fabulous. Okay, and the, one of the reasons it is, is because of these fabulous flies. So this one has a mouth part that is so long, if it was a human, our tongue would be six meters long, uh, just to show you how extreme these creatures are. And unlike the moths that can curl up their mouth parts and be very nice and tidy, this poor fly just has to bend it underneath its body and fly with its hanging out the back of it. So these are quite cumbersome things, but very important. You get rid of that fly, and eight species of fly uh, plant will die out immediately. It's a guild pollinator. I haven't talked about flirting in at least two slides, so I'm back on flirting. This is another type of fly. These are called moose flies. I think you can see why we call them moose flies. Uh, these, again, very territorial males. So he has grown these fabulous adornments out the side of his teeth, which he used to defend his territory. I did some field work in Ethiopia, and I got very, very behind because I came across a group of um, head-butting males on a, a decomposing tree stump. And instead of doing my <coughs> professional work, thank you taxpayers, I actually just spent hours watching these fabulous creatures. You've also got the antennae. So these are the ears of the insect. Um, they don't just use them for hearing, although they're incredibly sensitive. Did you know a male mosquito has the same hearing ability as a human? So it can hear you trying to hide from it. Uh, but also the males will use them for territory guarding. This fabulous creature in the bottom left, these curly whirly antennae basically are his are like dancing arms. You can't come any close. This is my territory. Back off. And they fly over the water, defending this tiny bit of water, waiting for the female to come along. Now, there's not just um, on uh, ears on the head. Some of these creatures have got ears on their shoulder pads, as it were. This is one of the tachinids. It's a parasitic fly. And it has, it's tiny, tiny fly. And if you think about our hearing, how we triangulate where the noise comes from. We've got quite a big distance between your left ear and our right ear. And if you're a creature one millimeter in size, two millimeters, you haven't got a lot of uh, area within you to be able to triangulate where these noises come from. So what they've done, they've developed this amazing amplification system where they can actually amplify the noise so, um, to enable them to find the hosts of the larvae. So it's the females that have this. So she needs to be able to find a grasshopper from quite a distance away and locate exactly where it is because she's basically got one chance to lay her egg in it. Now we, again, people cleverer than myself, have been able to mimic this and we're developing very tiny little hearing aids to enable us to hear much more clearly than we can with the present larger, slightly more cumbersome methods. Flirting, again, legs. So we've got some fabulous different examples of legs, but these are part of the empoids. These are the dance flies. This is a hilara. And its first part of its leg, and its foot, as it were, is expanded because these are where its silk glands are. So these little creatures will make presents for the ladies, which is very romantic. Some of them will wrap up gifts. So they will give a decomposing fly for the female to feast upon and enable him to get his nefarious way. It's not all uh, about um, attracting the ladies. These are raptorial front legs. So this is called a mantis fly. I think you can see why. And it is amazing. And these flies shred other insects apart. And that might sound quite gruesome, but they also are very good at shredding uh, mosquito larvae. So they're great for biological control. There's some amusing examples of raptorial front legs um, of biting midges when they're in a swarm. And the female will use her biting, uh, her raptorial legs to grab onto the male that she's in the process of copulation with. And she will pierce through his eyeballs. She will release a digestive enzyme, dissolve his insides, eat fat, and then drop this withered husk after the act is done. It's not very romantic for the fly. We got some lovely wings. Flies are known for their wings. And these are huge. This is a, a type of house fly found in New Zealand. The male's got massive wings. We presume for showing off, but we have no idea. And they are really, really good flyers. This is a hoverfly. And we've been looking at the mechanics of flying for a while. 
Uh, we have tethered flies into all sorts of different situations to understand how they move, how they fly. Uh, our neighbours in Imperial are doing lots of fun and exciting work looking at these. And it's not just for fun, our amusement for ourselves. We're also using it to develop like nanobots. So uh, these little nanobots are amazing and they're based on the flight mechanics of insects, uh, especially the flies. And we can now send these into environments that are hazardous for ourselves. And what's quite exciting is some are going to Mars. So flies truly are inspirational for some of the great explorers. Not all flies have wings. They're not called walks. I've heard that joke quite a lot. But this is quite a lovely little one. It looks like a little teddy bear. And if you can just figure it out, it's riding around the back of bees. OK, so this is a kleptoparasite, meaning that it just kind of eats the waste that this um, messy queen is leaving round her mouth parts. So it will go down and go num, num, num. We should really train these for males with their amazing astute beards. You can have these little cleany parasites coming along. But this is a sad story. This is one of the examples where when we put down all the mitocides uh, back uh, into the bee honey hive in the UK, we actually got rid of this fly. We didn't get rid of the mites, but we destroyed the fly, which is such a shame because it has such a unique ability in the fact that it completely mimics the chemicals of the queen. And we don't quite understand whether it's actually producing its own or is it's rubbing itself in the essence of the queen. Again, more questions to be answered. Flies are covered in bristles. Yeah, these bristles are a taxonomic nightmare. Some of them are very, very stable, however, and we use them, whether a, fly, a hair is pasted forward or backwards, to tell you whether it's one species or another. It has caused me a lot of problems. But it's enabled some of these flies to get into extreme habitats. Because this is a scuba diving fly. Yep, we know that are quite a few insects scuba dive. This is quite good. Uh, this is so cool. It is basically got an air bubble surrounding it, created by its hairs. Except around its eyes. The eyes are still naked to enable it to be able to see when she dives underwater to the bottom of the lake to lay her eggs. Now, what is unusual about the flies in comparison to the other diving animals is this lake is saline to the extreme. These are the mono lakes in California. Um, and these are a really, really hostile environment. But this little fly has managed to somehow develop a little system to enable her to successfully dive underwater. We have all sorts of things. The abdomen stage of the fly now. So we've got the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And the abdomen is the kind of morphologically boring bit on the outside, obviously apart from the genitalia, which I'll leave to last. But inside it, it's got all sorts of things, as well as the gut function and all sorts of things like that, which is absolutely necessary. There's some crazy things going on with some of them. So their malpighian tubules are the kidneys of the flies. And in these, this is a keraplatid, it's a type of gnat. And these are found in the caves in New Zealand. And these are the glowing flies. And my mother went here, which is really annoying, and said, oh, Erica, it was lovely. And I'm yet to go because it's quite a sight of all of these droplets hanging down. And these are killing strands, killing threads, because each of those contains uh, enzymes which dissolve whatever insect flies into them, lured in by these bioluminescent kidneys that this little fly has. So it's fantastic. And we're actually taking this bioluminescence and using it to help us mark genes, to help us understand things like circadian rhythm. So once more, these nasty little predators, and they are vicious, are helping science. Obviously, fly people will talk about genitalia a lot. Um, we are obsessed by it, but for good reasons, because actually these features are the, the features that move, that change and alter quickly. So it helps us determine what species, one species from another species. Now, if any of you have hang around with dipters for a long time, you know that often the conversation, although it goes straight to genitalia, we're always talking about male genitalia. I can't tell you how many times I've sat in a conversation where everyone talks about how boring female genitalia is. So I thought I would bring some nice genitalia to the table to start with. This fly, these are called bee grabbers. And I think you can kind of tell what they do by their name. And she has basically a can opener, a tin opener for her genitalia. Because this species here, Sickers, this grabs bumblebees and she will slice it open and then she will insert her larvae in, which will happily develop 
in this slightly annoyed bumblebee now. So they have amazing ones. When you um, let your fruit bowl decompose on your living room table, you'll be able to see some of these, the fruit flies that come up with exceptionally hard pointy genitalia uh, ovipositors to enable her to pierce the skin of the fruit. So they are quite exciting in their own right. But <laughs> there is no getting around the males and their extraordinary diversity of genitalia. I always think these look like those buzzing machines when you were little and you had to kind of get yourself around an electric wire to stop it buzzing because these properly are curly whirly genitalia and they're extraordinary. And what is going on behind the scenes with flies is this massive sex war. Basically the females and the males are fighting as much with each other as they are fighting with other species, which has led to the development of these strange structures. And it's also led to the development or some extraordinary sperm. Okay, this is a Drosophila. So this is one of the vinegar flies, very, very famous flies that everyone has been studying in genetics and medicine for over a hundred years now. And this specific species here has, it's only about three millimeters long. Its sperm is 5.8 centimeters long. And they don't produce a lot, obviously. Um, they actually have basically uh, their genitalia, their adiagus, their penis, fires out about 10 of these and in, in, in balls. So it's like a machine gun or a popper as it's popping out this gen uh, these sperm into the female. And it has to be that long because her insides are a complete curly whirly mess as well to try and limit these little males from fertilizing them. Bless them, the males do have to end up in some very bizarre situations to enable them to go through the act. This poor male is just hanging around and we will see this many times. If you go out in early April in your gardens in the UK, if you're lucky enough to have bee flies, you may be lucky enough to see a poor male being dragged along by a female. But these strange modifications, these adaptations have enabled us to have some amazing species. This is a robber fly. It's venomous. It's got a moustache. It's a top, top predator. It gets into all sorts of things. These are one of my favorite family of flies. These are acroceras. These are called hunchback flies or alternatively spider killing flies. And the one on the right, that eats, that feeds upon tarantulas. So the whole thing about all the spiders killing the flies, there's a whole group of them that have turned the table. And they've used their morphology to explore to some of the most extreme environments in the world and in space, as they were the first animal to go up in space as well. But this one, this is a coronamid, it's a non-biting midge. And these are found swimming around the oceans in the South Pacific and lovely areas like that. I'm yet to persuade the NHM to give me funding to go and find them. And here he is, we've got a male here. and He's got vestigial wings and his little, little wings are no longer used as wings. They are paddles, they're oars, as he rows around the surface of the ocean looking for an adult female. He's got very long antennae, which he uses to fill the surface, and very long legs, again, to actually enable him to feel for her, because she doesn't even bother changing form to become uh, an adult shape. She basically develops her genitalia and sticks it through the surface of the ocean. So he has to row around just trying to find her genitalia. Now, this is quite extreme, but then you add the fact that he is only an adult for two and a half hours, and she is only an adult for half an hour and you realize what a crazy world those flies live in. So that was just a quick run through, um, celebrating the new book, which I'm gonna promote. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it, thank you. Thank you so much, Erica, that was great. Um, we do have a few questions on the side. I'll start with the first one. Um, do, this is, question is from Sarah Kronig and she's asking, do multiple or even all species of Diptera display sexual dimorphism with the positioning of their compound eyes? No, sadly, um, a lot do. Uh, so uh, hoverflies, a lot of hoverflies do, uh, a lot of horseflies do. Houseflies, um, the male eyes are bigger, but they will not hit each other. So um, sadly, it's not a character that we can always use. Um, but generally, um, no, yeah, I, it's, it, it varies across the 180 or so families, sadly. Um, and next in the line is Aidan, who's all of 10 years old, 
and he Hi. wants to know does the botfly larvae kill the animal does uh, it? it depends uh, most of the time no um, a, a camel for example can have 200 botflies living in its nostrils which apparently is it's not overly pleasant but it doesn't cause them to die um, humans we only get say one botfly at a time and once uh, the little maggot has finished feasting uh, it will merge out of its hole and your hole will clear up so you wouldn't even know it's been there apart from the the memories of it m munching away at night so some of them will some of them are parasitoids and that ultimately results in the death of their host so those tachinids i talked about generally their hosts will die right um so is a fly a fly sand flies bite do they yep. count as flies Yes. So, uh, yeah, so sandflies uh, are a type of fly. Uh, they are phlebotomines and they are within, you have them in the, in the UK, we have the other half of the family and they are, they live around compost. So the reason, okay, here's a good way of remembering whether a fly is a fly. So you've got dragonflies and mayflies and things like that. Now, if that's one word, so dragonfly is a word, that probably means it's not a true fly. But house flies, horse flies, hover flies should have a space or a hyphen in it. And then you know it's a true fly. Hmm. There's grammar in it. Um, yeah. Does the kleptoparasitic mite only live on honeybees or on our native bees as well? So the kleptoparasitic fly, that family of flies only lives on honeybees. Right. We don't know why. I, I think it's... It, They've evolved alongside them because obviously yeah, the honeybee is social and it does live on the feral honeybees. Right. Um, okay, on to the next. What does the saline scuba diving fly larvae eat in salt water? Um, there's a lot of decomposing material from other animals. So again, they're, they're going around feasting on, our, on the, the remains and the, the, the fecal matter of other animals, clearing up the countryside for us. Um, okay, and I'm going to end this with a good question to you, Erica. What in your hit list of flies are your three most favorite species? Uh, Everybody hates this question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I hate that question. Yeah. Okay, last uh, two weeks ago, I got to see that hornet robber fly that I showed you, the, the robber fly with the big yellow and black body. And um, I've been trying to see that for 15 years. So I may have done some dancing when I saw that. Um, obviously the bee flies, because they are adorable and it's the worst example, example of maternal care because she just hurls eggs around the garden, which I, I, you know, I think is brilliant. And a third one, oh, I can't do this. Oh, you put me on the spot now. <laughs> I don't know, I just, maybe it is the camel bot fly just because it is quite extreme and i do like extreme life cycles you, you should have seen erica dancing in a cloud of bee flies in <laughs> I, i'm so happy i know that was a good day <laughs> okay one last question because i'm interested in this one as well are there any flies that can be eaten oh we or can we eat um, them all yeah you you believe me you've eaten a lot of them <laughs> um, what I do is I try and identify them as I swallow them as I cycle around London. But you, uh, pro uh, professionally as it were, uh, yes, uh, Hermatia elucens, the black soldier fly. Uh, this is one that uh, we're breeding this up in factories in South Africa and various other places around the world. I believe we've got some in Wales now. And at the moment, we're only feeding it to our livestock. They are protein packed. They're absolutely amazing, mm -hmm. uh, really, really good. Obviously, uh, we can feed them on like compost. So we can get rid of waste, feed them up, and then feed them to our animals. So they're absolutely fantastic in this cycle. We don't have to cause more problems to the planet. We are trying to figure out how we can eat them. Uh, our Food Standards Authority it has certain guidelines on animals and what animals we can eat, and suddenly insects are being thrown into the mic. And they're like, ooh, it doesn't matter that we've been eating insects for thousands of years and over 200 or 2,000 different countries, 2,000 different types of insects are being eaten at the moment already. But yeah, you will be eating housefly maggots soon. Yum.
right. So, Yay. Becca, I ha there's one more question which came in while you were answering those, which actually I'd like to know the answer to as well. Is somebody asked, what did, what did flies evolve from? Which I think the, the question really is, what's the sister group of flies? Who's the most closely related insects to flies? Hey, you know, this is quite unusual because if I tell you, you're gonna, uh, uh, fleas. <laughs> Yay. So fleas and uh, scorpion flies, not true flies. So they're all in the, the group antlion and morpha, which are not antlions. So I don't, it's just don't, you know, we lie with our names. And these were, this group were the earliest pollinators. So they were pollinating gymnosperms before angiosperms even got around to evolving. So you got to thank these flies for a lot of things. And the fleas, don't forget the fleas. <laughs> well, flies and fleas and we thank them all erica thank you so much thank for, you as always very engaging lecture and um do record those lovely details about a 33 percent discount on erica's new book i thought i'd do you an advert erica <laughs> thank you you're very welcome and um and please do come back to other linnaean society lunchtime or evening lectures um they're all advertised on the website and for now we're doing them all online so anybody anywhere can come and participate. So thanks ever so much.